And I should not be recording. Yep, if you see it on screen. Excellent. So in today's video lab, I want to move on to our high-low guess game. So in this lab, really the uh, learning objectives are going to be to learn about the document object model and event handling. So let's take a quick look at our table of contents here. So we're going to break it down this lab into three different parts. And before we get to any of these parts, we're going to first go into the introduction of the lab where we'll discuss what the learning concepts are and uh, the concept of what a single page app is. Now, this won't be uh, necessarily super unfamiliar to you because in the, the previous lab, we built effectively a single page app. However, we were drawing everything into the canvas, whereas with this app, we're actually also going to render uh, HTML elements. So here you'll get a chance to see how we can partner JavaScript and HTML uh, together to make an interactive experience uh, in terms of updating our HTML or our DOM. And so the first part would be to build a basic high-low game. And we'll talk more about what that is, uh, but it'll set, uh, the first one will be effectively just turn-based and text-based. And the second one will be turn-based and text-based, but it will use an MVC design as opposed to a MVP design. And then lastly, we will, we will build the same thing, but it would be time-based and graphics-based using an MVC design. And of course, we'll break down those concepts as we get to those sections. And then each one of these parts has a couple different goals that builds us out to a complete project and then we'll refactor, build that out and then refactor and build that out. Okay, so let's introduce the concept. The first thing is the prereqs for every lab. Uh, so this is our DOM and events lab. So it's partners with the lectures for the DOM and events. Uh, and so you don't really need any critical software outside of just having your Chrome browser and a code editor, pretty much everything we've had up to this point. Uh, the motivation behind this lab is we wanna learn about the document object model API and, uh, and JavaScript to make some interactive HTML based apps. Now we already know a lot about JavaScript, so we'll really be highlighting or focusing more on the uh, DOM components here. Uh, the goal for this particular lab is to build a compelling, fun version of the high-low game that runs in a browser using JavaScript and DOM API. Now, when I, I keep I keep saying high-low game, is everyone familiar with the concept of this game? I'm pretty sure this is like a game that you built in 1583. Um, but if not, let me just give the basic rules. It might be given later on, but then we'll just go over it again. Uh, the idea behind this is you might have a certain number of guesses, let's say 10 guesses to guess the number uh, across maybe a thousand, you know, from one to a thousand. And then whatever your guess is, you're told whether the number is too high or too low. And that gives you a clue on how to narrow down to, uh, to guess more uh, strategically or, or intelligently next time so that you can try to isolate down to that number. So it's a, it's a pretty good common kind of programming, uh, a game to program because it hits up all the different components inside of a coding language where you have to store data, you have to do selection statements and uh, repetition statements, you have to do some processing on your data, some data processing, and you have to display results. Okay, so the learning objectives here is we want to learn about the document object model API and access uh, and update the HTML document from the browser, from our JavaScript runtime environment. We're going to learn a little bit about event-driven system design. We're going to learn a little bit about agile practices. Uh, when I was stating MVP earlier, that's what we will call the minimal viable product. Uh, that'll be our initial focus when we go to build out. But then when we refactor our code base, we're going to move to an MVC, which is our model view controller design pattern. So our first build, we're not going to care about necessarily adhering to proper design patterns. We care about just building something that works. And then once we get something that works, we'll refactor it into something that's better. 
We also are going to talk about some UI UX considerations and improvements that we can make as we keep implementing our game. And then we'll talk about setting up some timed events and uh, date objects. Okay. Now, the project architecture is we're going to start the project by downloading the starter files from GitHub, just like we have been. And then we will uh, see that the project structure below. So we'll have our high low game. Then we'll have our HTML file right in the root project directory. And then subdirectors would be an assets directory that should contain all like the artwork we might need for this lab. And then a scripts directory where we're going to put all of our JavaScript code. Okay. And then we have this link here. Let's go ahead and uh, grab that. Well, look at this. Let me. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do that. And let's get that set up. Let's go over here. Let me take this. Let's hide this. I don't need this here. Or something. Okay, here we go. Now I'll just go ahead and rename this. So it's just uh, what? High low JS dash style. Perfect. Okay. So initially I have an assets directory. Yeah, and my assets directory has things that we'll use in part three when we talk about having something that's graphics based. Okay, let me create, let me get this set up to be similar to what it wants though. I will have a scripts directory. Okay, so I just made that just now. So nothing's in there yet because I haven't written any scripts. I don't have an HTML page. So all we have is assets. So I'm going to start by just making that scripts folder now so that I now emulate this for the most part. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the document object model. So the DOM, or what I'll start just calling the DOM from now on. The DOM gives JavaScript access to the HTML document. The DOM is a built-in object with, uh, which has functions and properties purposely designed for manipulating the HTML. Uh, the DOM converts HTML uh, um, elements into JavaScript objects. And uh, the lecture will discuss exactly how those get modeled into node objects and what the hierarchy on that is. Uh, so a document object is a global object that is the entry point into the DOM API. It, it, it itself is a property of the window object, which is the global object for everything inside of our browser. Uh, but we have an alias to the document object that is just document. So again, if we were to go, let me go to the browser here. If I was to just type in document right inside of there, you could see it's something that exists and it actually represents the HTML that's in this blank page right here. Okay, and then we also have element objects though. Uh, so the document object accesses our element uh, objects via a get element by ID call, and then we can pass it the ID that that HTML has. Uh, these element objects are the uh, JavaScript models of the HTML elements for the web page. Now we could also access our HTML elements with just the ID names themselves, like what we did in the very beginning of the course in the first lab. However, it's preference that we use a call to the document object. And I'll, I'll highlight why that's the case a little when we actually start the lab. I'll actually give you an example of that. And then one, one other thing that we should talk about that's going to be relevant for the, uh, the DOM for this lab is the inner HTML, which we've already seen before. Again, we've seen this in lab one. So that's going to take away some of the surprises from this lab since I had reauthored that one. But inner HTML, as you might already know, is a property of an element uh, of an element object that maintains its HTML and markup notation strings. So by changing the value of an inner HTML, the element may add, change, delete HTML from our DOM, which then will cause our viewport to re-render with the new contents. Now, you don't ever want to use outer HTML because that'll actually uh, uh, change the, the HTML element 
itself that you're operating on for it to not even exist anymore. It'll actually pull it out of the uh, out of the tree if you modify that. So we strictly usually stick to the inner HTML. Okay, let's talk a little bit about events now, or in particular browser events. Uh, so web browsers are event-driven systems, right? They're graphics based, and they have all sorts of uh, mouse inputs and click. Uh, events or keyboard events that kind of trigger it. So a uh, browser generates and manages events based on certain actions or triggers. Those events may be used by JavaScript apps to trigger actions or behaviors. So some things you should know about using events in an events-driven system, we need an event listener. So an event listener effectively registers an element object to listen to the event queue for a specific type of event. And when the event occurs, it invokes a callback function. So when we, after we registered a event listener to the event delegator, uh, when that happens, this is what triggers the callback function. So a callback function is simply just a function within our JavaScript application that is passed as a reference to the event system. When an event occurs, the event system invokes that callback function. And then what happens is we're given an event object when to this callback function. So whenever callback function is invoked, the browser passes an event object as a parameter. This event object has properties specific to that event. I think we've seen this before. I think I, I had, uh, when we were doing the um, platformer game, I illustrated what an event object looked like because the console logged it. And then just know you have different types of events. Again, we've kind of seen this already because of the platformer game. Every event object has a type the event listener matches the event object type to a callback function. Uh, this is similar to like a key value pair. And so event types are represented as strings in terms of this lookup. And they might appear as like click or load or, or uh, key down or key up or things along those lines. Okay. Now let's talk about a little bit of architectural um, concepts. So I'm sure everyone should be familiar with the idea of model view controller or what's commonly referred to as MVC. So MVC is just a design pattern where an app's responsibilities are divided into uh, three different partitions, whether it's a part of the model of the app, whether it's part of the controls of the app, or whether it's part of the view from the app. And so the model effectively managed all of the app's core logic with concerns for handling uh, Oh, um, um, without concerns, right? So it's, it's all about modeling the core logic. And so we will disentangle any concept of input and output from the model. And then the controller handles the user input to send data and invoke actions within our model. And then our view will manage outputting the data from the model and presenting it to the user. And so this will be a common theme of trying to organize our, uh, our apps all throughout. We'll find that it's, it's, it's a very powerful approach to building out web applications, being able to identify these three different parts of your application and keeping them kind of uh, discrete. So for goal zero, so before we start, let's, let's talk a little bit about a single page app. So a single page app, and, uh, and, and iterative build. So let me start with the concept of SPA. Uh, modern web applications minimize the number of HTML pages you get sent to down to one. And the reason why is it's now typically more important to preserve the JavaScript runtime uh, 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 data as opposed to uh, separating a website or web portal across multiple HTML documents. Like one bad thing about multiple HTML documents, like what we had in the first couple of labs is that every time you, you link from one HTML page to another, anything that was stored in your JavaScript runtime environment, you lose. And since so much about what we do now is based off of computations happening in the background on JavaScript, we want to preserve that. And since, in fact, the browser maintains all the HTML elements that's being presented to you in memory as a, uh, as a collection of JavaScript objects in the form of a tree, we can modify the HTML in real time 
and re-render all new content. And so instead of focusing on building new HTML documents that have HTML pages spread across, like different HTML content spread across it, what's preference is you just update the HTML in this current page based off of whatever the state of your application is. Yeah, that bird is really chirpy. <laughs> It's a nice day outside. Um, okay, so with that said, so the motivation moving forward is all of our web apps on our client side, we wanna start focusing with this, with this kind of design metaphor of having it be a single page app. So we have one HTML page and then all the content that's gonna get displayed to the end user will be updated via the JavaScript. Iterative builds, we're very, uh, we're very um, familiar with this concept. This means we're going to start by building something simple, and then we're iteratively going to add complexity to this. And this is a great strategy to go ahead and build out in any kind of application. You start by identifying what is the core feature set, and can I get just that built? And then you can go back and do a refactor of it, and then plan out how to add each new feature thereafter. And you can create a set of milestones for yourself, like what I'm about to do, so that I'll get to a final app. So here, my part one, I'm going to focus strictly on this idea of a minimal viable product. So I'm gonna focus on the, just getting what the app's necessities are. Then once I have that built, I'm going to refactor my app with the model view controller pattern and improve the, the uh, user uh, interface on it. And so that version will refactor the code base into effectively three parts where we have a model that ma uh, manages the logic. We have a view that's gonna manage the uh, output and we'll have a controller that manages the input. And then our final version, we will go ahead and improve the UX even further, make it more attractive, start using graphics to display um, uh, our output. And instead of being a turn-based game, we will make it a time-based game to make it more compelling, to make it more fun. Okay, so now that we have our goals, let's actually move to part one. Building a turn-based, text-based uh, high-low game using the MVP design. And so here you can see a mock-up that I make. And it's always good to have mock-ups. I think uh, you'll have to make some mock-ups for your final uh, project. It's one, of the, um, it's one of the tasks you'll be assigned to do. So you could use this conceptually of how you might have to explore what a mock-up uh, might get rendered as. So here we'll have our index.html. And we'll see we have guess and number. We'll have an input field. We'll have a submit button. And then when we submit, uh, essentially our game will listen for that submit to occur. And then it will take in and define whether it was too high or whether it was too low as a response. Okay, and I think we've covered a lot of these concepts up to, up to this point. So we're using a minimal viable product. So this lab uses an agile approach for developing the high-low game. So if you've, if you've heard of the concept of agile design, this is effectively what it means. It means instead of planning everything all at once uh, and then starting your implementation phase, you do a little bit of uh, planning, then a little bit of implementation, then go back to planning and implementation. You test in between, right? So the exact same way we've been building software in all of our labs is using an agile approach to software development. It, uh, yeah, we focus on the initial build of delivering an MVP. An MVP is a version of our app with just enough features to be usable by early users who can then evaluate it for future development. So that's what our goal. We have this proof of concept. Can we get something just to play around with it and say, okay, what do we need to add on to it to make it a more feature rich and something that we can potentially deploy or release in the future to the general public? So an MVP... In terms of MVP specifications, the specification defines the necessary features uh, for this version of the application. So we need to, so our goal here, what, what we need to have is be able to capture inputs from the user through the browser's viewport, update the browser's viewport with the player's results and implement the core game logic for executing the high logo. So this is what we would consider a success for our MVP uh, build. 
Okay, so now let's move on to our goal for our MVP build. So goal one, we need the HTML for our high-low game. So here, we're going to break every one of our goals into the same thing we've been doing, an approach, and apply, and an improve, or a planning phase, a do phase, and a testing phase. So in our planning phase, we need to make an HTML document that gives the game's instructions and its uh, user inputs. So we will need to create, to in, and actually to do that, we'll have to create an index.html uh, file and implement it with the base HTML content. Now here, uh, I'm not gonna cover too much about what's, what's going on in here because we should know. Okay, let's see here. Let's do this. Where am I? LS. No, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Oh, uh, yeah. There. Okay, let's go into labs. Mm -hmm. And uh, where am I now? And let's go into. So there we go. Perfect. Okay. So let us make an HTML page. There we go. Let me get that into my editor here. And uh the moment I'm gonna get everything formatted appropriately. Okay, perfect. So what do we have here? Uh, we have an HTML document, we have a head. And on this first phase, we, we're just gonna mock up. The first goal is we're going to try to create this mock-up on our index.html, right? So that's pretty simple. We're just going to implement some things in the body, a paragraph that says, this is a number between zero to 999. You have 10 guesses, enter a guess, and then we'll have a, um, an input to try to capture tax. And then we'll have an input that will be a button that we can go ahead and we'll uh, say to submit. So let me save that. And actually let's, uh, let's go over here up in here and here yeah you can see bam there we go and actually let me just go to developer tools here nothing's there no javascript but i'll have that open okay so that's a good mock-up of what we're initially going for so when we open that we have the initial interface that we need for this game so again for high low the rules are going to be you have uh guesses between, well, you have 10 guesses, but you have to guess between zero to uh, 999. And you can enter your guess here and then we'll get feedback eventually. So we got the initial state going. So let's move on to the next goal. So here um, we'll have our DOM for the uh, JavaScript controller. So we're, we're gonna set up our event listener, right? So here the basic approach is in this iteration, the HTML inputs are accessed from JavaScript which listens for a button click and triggers a callback function in response. So how can we go ahead and do this? Well, in our apply phase, we're gonna have to modify something in our index.html. We're gonna have to link the game.js file to index.html uh, and give its input ID attribute to access it. So right here, we're gonna have to do a couple of things and we'll, we'll give our input type an ID here, an ID here, and then we gotta link the script. So let's go and do that. So we'll go here, let's get to our source code. So if I wanna access this in the Java, in our JavaScript, right? We're gonna to have to give each of our HTML elements an ID. So this is gonna represent the guest text, line seven there. And then the other, the button is gonna represent the, the button we, we select for guessing. So let me go over here and add that, okay. And now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to link at the very bottom our script. Here, okay, so now we have a script tag that's gonna link into our script section, a game.js, 
doesn't exist yet. Let me actually go into my script section now and actually make that, knowing that that's going to be the next thing I'm going to likely have to do. So let's go and make a game JS. Okay, scripts. We'll open that up now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now now we're importing game.js and we'll put all of our logic in here. And since these have IDs, we'll be able to access them from our JavaScript environment. Excellent. And now, so now the next step is we're going to go ahead and use the document object to get HTML by ID and add an event listener to the button with a callback function. So let me just grab this and then we'll walk through this code. Okay, this is, um, stop that. Let's make this look a little bit nicer. That goes there, that goes there. Okay, so something like that. Okay, let's, okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the HTML elements as JavaScript objects. And so I'm going to grab the button and I'm gonna grab the number. And to grab those, I'm going to do uh, document. So this is a document object. The document object has a method that's called get element by ID. And so what it's, what it's gonna do is it's gonna search the entirety of our uh, HTML contents, the tree of the HTML, and it's going to navigate until it finds a element with, the, with, with uh, whatever the appropriate ID is. So if the ID that it's looking for is guest text, then, or guest button. So this time it's guest button. So if it's guest button that it's looking for, it's going to return this element. And then we can save that element as a variable in here. And so since I don't intend yet to mutate the state of button or number, I'm going to declare these with the least amount of writable privileges possible, it's constant. I typically try to always keep everything at constant if possible. And if I determine later that I have to make it uh, writable, then I'll, I'll change it to a lit. Okay, so now I could have easily, I could have easily also done this. Well, I couldn't actually, these have underscores. So guess button doesn't, but if I change, if I would have named the variable something that, that used underscores instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, slashes or dashes, uh, I could have done this, right? But this is dangerous. We wanna avoid how we did this in the first lab. And I'll show you why. I'll show you why that's the case. Actually, let's, let's do that. Let me make, well, after, after this, when we're in the test phase, I'll show show you why we shouldn't do that. Okay, uh, what did I do? Oh, here, we can comment that back. Okay, so the, this is, uh, so we grab these two HTML elements, the button and the number. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna add an event listener to the button with a callback function. So the button element itself, because of inheritance, a button element is a type of node. And at the very root node that every HTML element that's modeled in the DOM has, it, it has a membership to the, um, uh, essentially it is a, uh, an event target object. So because the event target is like the parent node to all the nodes that make up our HTML tree, they can all be, have this uh, method that's called add event listener. This add event listener allows a event target object which button is a member of to be able to register itself to register itself with the uh, event delegator that's built into the browser. And so then add event listener allows us to say, okay, here's a type of event that we're going to listen for. Whenever this event occurs, trigger this callback function on, on this element. And so the cool thing about this is since each element can be an event target, you can actually have multiple elements registered for the same event with different callback functions. So we're not gonna do that here, but just understand like when a click event occurs, you don't necessarily are limited to buying just one callback function to it. You can bind any number of callback functions and the event handler will essentially just go through everything that was registered with it and, and do the callbacks on each of the individual elements that it now has a reference to. Okay, so this is how easy it is to add an event listener so that we can go ahead and start listening for a click event. 
And then we have to give it a reference to a function. Notice this isn't a function invocation. Functions in JavaScript are objects in the, of themselves. So we're assigning this, this we're, we're giving a reference to the function when we register the event listener that will later invoke it when the click event occurs. And so when, this, when the click event does occur, we're gonna invoke this guest number and the guest number is going to pull the value from this other HTML element that we grab. So we grab the text fields here. So one of the things inside of the text fields uh, are for inputs is an attribute called value. So we'll grab that value. We'll assign that to a uh, local uh, constant, just a, a guess, and we'll print that into our console. So let's actually test this out. Okay. So if I put, uh, let me refresh my page. Let me type in 100 into the text field. I hit the submit and there we go. And that's going to print console log 100. Excellent. So now we've, we're listening for an event and now we're actually doing something in response to that. Now I had claimed earlier and I wanna prove this, I could do something like this. So suppose that I had an ID of, um, uh, let's call this foo. Okay, so suppose I have foo here, right? Now what we've learned up to this point is that, and let me refresh my page, I could access foo if I wanted to just by the ID from the HTML page, right? I don't have to do this big long, thing document dot get uh, element by ID and then pass in foo. This is the other way that I'm, I'm advocating that you, you do. So notice I get foo either way, whether I just use the ID of foo or if I go to the document object and say, hey, get the element by ID with foo. So uh, I'm telling you to do this big, much longer way instead of this much simpler, easier way, but I'm gonna justify it. I'm gonna give you a rationale why you should do it the way that I'm presenting it now. It's because in JavaScript, this ID, that's, it's, it's mutable, right? It's not constant. There's no way to make that constant. And uh, so, 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 so say for instance, then I decide to overwrite it. Let's say, hey, foo, uh, now you are, uh, have the value of bar. Right, so now whenever I dereference foo, it now has bar, right? I'm no longer dereferencing my HTML element. And so with IDs in HTML, it can be very common that you have variables in JavaScript that are similar in name than the ID attributes labeled to you in your HTML elements. And if at any time you accidentally overwrite it, then you lose reference to the HTML element. And uh, you know that's an easy mistake to make that's hard to catch. And so one way to make sure you always are grabbing references to that document object is, well, even though I don't have access to it through the ID anymore, right? Because I've accidentally uh, or purposely in this case, assigned it a new value, I can still grab it using the document object. Get element by ID, I type in foo and look, there it is. So, but even though this one, the actual ID itself no longer works. So you can see this is a much safer way to ensure that the, the, what I'm getting back, what I'm dereferencing is the thing I expect it to be. So just, you know, something to be aware of. Okay, and we tested it out, that out and that's looking great to me. So the next thing we're gonna do here in our high-low game is we wanna add some game logic to it. Uh, so in terms of our approach for adding our game logic, well, we wanna implement the basic algorithm, algorithm for the high-low game. And so uh, effectively the game's output will display to the console so that we don't have to worry about updating uh, uh, to our, uh, our viewport yet. We're, we're gonna make that a different consideration in the future. We're just focusing on an MVP built here. So in terms of doing this, well, first let's go ahead and create uh, some variables for the random passcode and the number of tries remaining. Okay, let's see. So let's go here. 
So this will represent my high low game data. So I always try to put my data towards the top whenever I develop. That way it's easy to read for myself and for future uh, developers who come back to read my code. And I always try to comment out each of these lines too, as you might notice. So here, this is gonna represent my high low game data. And so I need a passcode, the thing that we're trying to guess. And uh, the stipulation for a win or loss condition is you have to do it in a limited number of tries or attempts. So here, uh, you will be giving 10 tries. And so notice the passcode won't change, but the number of tries will. So that's going to uh, have me determined to use a lit to define my tries versus a const for my passcode. Now, uh, we have a math class built in to, or a math object built into our JavaScript. It's part of the API. So here, and I actually have a lecture on that, on, uh, on uh, the math class and the local storage class and a couple of other built-in classes, the uh, day class. Here at any time, what, one great thing about uh, JavaScript is the dev tools is a pretty full featured, like um, it, it, it offers a lot of the tooling you'd expect a full featured IDE to have. So when I type in math, and if I type in dot, it's going to try to autocomplete for me. And so if you wanted to survey what kind of math functions you could call or methods, methods you could call in the math object, you can just kind of scroll through and see all of them. You see the math function is pretty well defined. In fact, it probably has all the same methods, if not more, than the math class that, uh, that Java has. And of course, one of those is going to be uh, the ability to produce random numbers, right? And when we do that, notice the behavior of our random number is going to be a random number between zero and one, which is exactly the same as what Java's math.random function is. Okay. So we're, what we're going to, oh, let me get to my source code here. So what we're going to do is we're going to call math.random. And since it's going to be a number, a random number between zero to one, we'll multiply it by a thousand. So now I'll get a random number between zero and 999. Now, because one is not inclusive, so I can never get one from math.random. I could get 0 0.999999, but never actually one. And then once I do that, I'm going to floor it so I don't have a fractional number anymore. That way I have an integer number and that'll represent my passcode. Excellent. So now that we have that, let's move on to step two, where we're going to implement the logic for evaluating a guess to determine if the user had won, lost, or gets a clue. So let me grab this. I'm going to add this function in here. And actually, this is our guess number function. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of my old one. So because I'm just going to replace it out with this new one. The, that old one was a test one. Typically, you'd want to just go ahead and refactor, but I'm just going to, for brevity's sake, replace it. Okay, so now I have a guess number function, but instead of just passing off the, uh, just instead of just console logging out the, uh, the value, I'm going to grab the guess from the text field. I'm going to decrement tries on each time we guess a number. I'm going to console log the number of attempts left is, and then the, the, the value of tries. And then I'm going to check if guess is equal to passcode, then we won the game. And we got it in whatever the number of tries is, uh, 10 minus whatever the, the number of attempts is. And then otherwise, else if tries is less than zero, then we lost the game because we didn't get in the number of attempts we get. So this is our winning condition. This is our losing condition. And if we didn't win, and if we didn't lose, then we're going to call this other method, this other function that's going to be called give clue. And we're going to pass give clue the guess that the user had, uh, had supplied. So this simple selection statement that checks, did we win, did we lose, otherwise give a clue. So then we have to define that helper method. So we're going to define a function that gives a clue whether the guess was too low or was, whether it was too, too high. Okay, let's pretty this up. Can't have 
things not format it right. Okay, so this is the function responsible for giving us a clue. It will take in guess as a parameter. We're going to check. If guess is higher than the passcode, then we'll let the user know your guess is too high. Otherwise, we're going to let them know it was too low. We, knew, we know it either has to be too high or too low, because if it was just right, then they would have won, and we would have never given a clue. And if it's not too high, then it's too low, clearly. Excellent. OK, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually test this logic and see if it doesn't work. So now we'll play the game. We're going to submit some guesses using the button and read the results. And again, this is just a flow chart of how from index.html, we have these two input fields, right? A text field and a button. The logic of our game is going to listen for this button and invoke the guess action, right? With the callback function, which will then have our game.js file output to our console. So the purpose of this breakdown is to illustrate this connection that's kind of defining our model view controller, or I should say like our uh, kind of uh, scheme and how we're starting to see the relationship between our game logic and how it starts mutating its state over the run of its application. Or, or, or the, the, the cycle of the application running. Okay, so let's actually test this out. Let me go over here. Let me refresh. And now if I type in, let's say 500, it's gonna say number of attempts left is nine. 500 is too high. That means I gotta go lower, right? So let me do 250. Number of attempts left is eight. 250 is too low, okay? Uh, so now we have to go in between. So let's do like 375. Number of attempts left now is seven and 375 is too high. So we got to go lower. Let's say, um, let's do, uh, let's say 325. The number of left attempts is six. 325 is still too high. So my highest that I should go is 325. Uh, lowest should be 250. So let's say, um, let's do, let's do, let's see here, let's do 275. Okay, number of left uh, attempts is five, 275 is too low. Okay, so we're between two steps, so let's try 300. Number of attempts left is four, 300 is too low. Oh my, okay, so let's do like 312. 312 is too low and we only have three attempts left. Um, let's do like 318. Uh, we only have two attempts left, uh, but we win. We got in, in eight attempts. The number was 318, excellent. So uh, we can win the game. That's clearly working for our MVP. Let me refresh and see what happens if we just uh, submit, 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 submit. And okay, we lose. And the, the, uh, the passcode was 854. Perfect. So we have a, a loss and we have a one and our, get, our uh, clues work. So I feel good about this. In fact, um, let's see, what else do we need to do here? Uh, so for our uh, goal four here on this first build is we're now actually going to uh, move away from the uh, uh, using our, uh, our console and we're going to use the uh, inner HTML instead. So the general approach we want to do here is we want to use the DOM API to update the HTML elements from our JavaScript. So let's see, what are we going to do? We're first in our step in order to accomplish this is we're going to add an, an empty list for clues with an ID and also add an ID to the paragraph for attempts. So in our HTML, we are going to want to uh, update this, the number of guesses we have as the game progresses, and we're going to create a uh, unordered list that we're going to mutate into, that we're going to uh, go ahead and keep appending into. So let me grab this attribute, this ID here. And let's go into here and inside of here. So this is gonna have to mutate after we get, at each time we make a guess. So that means if I wanna access this inside of my JavaScript, I'll give it an ID of attempts. 
And then the other thing I want to do is I'm going to create a whole nother HTML element that's going to be designed to capture or to go ahead and, and present these clues to us. And I think we'll just represent that as an unordered list. And each time we make a guess, we'll append to this clues uh, unordered list. Excellent. So the next thing we want to do is we want to grab these, uh, the, uh, these two uh, elements, HTML elements, into our JavaScript. So let's go ahead and do the same thing we did to grab those uh, input fields. I'm going to go to the top here. And I'm going to grab my attempt view here, which I'm going to use document.getElementsById attempts. And then my close view, which is I'm just going to grab using the document object again with the get element by ID and the clues. So there's HTML elements that I just made. I'm going to grab and I'm going to store them into these constant variables to ensure that they're well protected and can't be over uh, uh, over uh, wrote. We don't overwrite them. Okay, then now that we've done that, let's refactor our code a little bit. So instead of using console logs, let's take those messages and actually use the inner HTML property of these element objects to uh, redefine what they're going to display. So I'm going to go to the tries. I'm going to replace my tries here where I'm updating the number of attempts left. And I'm going to instead tell, hey, attempts view from your inner HTML, use this text instead. And then I'm going to do the same thing here with uh, if we win. So on the instance of if we win, I'm going to, instead of using a console log, I'm going to, from the document object, the document object has um, actual references to the two primary root children of the HTML document. So from document, I can access both the body and the head. I'll show you that right here. So from document. And if you ever want to see what's in document, again, I could just hit dot here and I can scroll down and see every single function and property that document has available. So if you ever wanted to kind of survey and kind of discover what you could do with some of these built-in uh, objects in the browser, it's very easy to see what's available. Well, some of the ones that we're gonna care about is being able to actually access the head and the body elements, just like so. So even without ID tags, we always have access to like these root uh, children, the primary children of an HTML document. And what we're actually gonna do here is we're gonna access the inner HTML and we're gonna overwrite everything in our document, in our HTML document, so that it will have a heading element. So I have a heading element that's gonna say you win. And then I have a paragraph that says, got it in. And then I'm going to do that computation. So this is a string template. So again, I can pass a value using a dollar sign and uh, curly braces and do a computation inside. And it'll be 10 minus tries, the same way we were doing before. Perfect. And then I'm also gonna do that on the instance that we lose. And so here, there we go. So we're gonna do document.body.innerHTML. We'll do an assignment here and the same thing that we do with win, but with different message. You lose, the password was, and then we'll say what the passcode was. Well, he referenced that. Excellent. And then the next thing we need to do is inside of our uh, give clue function, because now inside our guest number function, we've updated the number of attempts and a win and loss message on the instances that those conditions occur. But we also have to update the give clue to actually give the clue inside of that uh, unordered list as opposed to the console. So here I'm going to update these console messages for when it's too high. Again, we'll access uh, clues view here. We'll access the inner HTML. But as opposed to overriding it, which is what we've done in all the other attempts where we've just removed what was there before, Instead, what we're going to do here is we're going to concatenate to it. So we're going to add to, we're going to maintain what was already there and add to it this string, a string uh, literal template that's going to be a list item that's going to give the guess and put it's too high if the guess is greater than the passcode. And then we'll do the same thing, but with the message that's too low on the instance that uh, on the other side of that selection statement. And then once we do this, we should have been, refactored our code 
such that instead of doing console logs with all of our data, we're now going to display it into our uh, viewport. So let's test this out and see if it's actually working. Okay, so let's uh, do this again. So 500, submit, and bam. So nothing, nothing in the console log anymore. I notice now I'm updating this to say number of attempts left is now nine, and it gives me this clue, 500 is too high. And then I'll do 250, oh, too low. Uh, then let's do um, 750 is too low. And uh, let's do 800, I'll just keep doing this, too low. 900, uh -huh. too high. Uh, 850, we just won't employ any strategy, we'll just randomly guess. 875 is too high. Um, oh, I guess 850 was too high. I've already done, okay. 750, I guess I should pay attention to the clues. 750, let's try 300. Let's do 125 or 120. Whatever I end up just putting into my, my my code let's see i have okay and there we go so that'll overwrite what we have there okay so we and this represents what happens when we overwrite the body we've lost everything there we we're told we lost the only way we can get back to the game is if we do a refresh excellent okay so that seems to be working and we know that the wind message will likely work too so that's it, that's done for part one. We have our minimal viable build, right? We have a version of the game that works in the browser where the end user can easily play and experience the game. So now let's move on to part two. Let's, uh, let's, turn, let's convert this into still being turn-based, still effectively being text-based, but let's start to subdivide our logic using this concept of an MVC pattern. So now that we've gotten something that works, we're gonna retool it so that it scales a little bit better so we can uh, continue to add uh, features and complexity to it. So this is gonna be a, a sample of what the finished project is gonna look like, where we're giving the same amount of rules. We're gonna have the number of attempts left, but instead of, um, but instead of, um, but we, we, we wanna, we're going to be motivated to kind of make things a little bit safer. So instead of having just this, like what are issues we might have here by typing in? Well, what if I type in letters, right? Like, well, that's too low. Well, that doesn't even make sense, right? So this is this works minimal viable product, but there's uh, you know there's some um, uh, there's definitely it's not very fault tolerant, right? It's not we haven't defended against improper input into our game system. So we wanna start having additional considerations as we start to refactor this and improve the functionality, right? This would be really frustrating if you're playing the game and, or what if I put in like a negative number, right? Like, or what if I put in a number that's too big, right? Like I can do all these things. Oh, that's not even a number, there's a Y in there. I can do all these things and they, you know, it, it's outside the scope to the number that's guessing. It's not even numbers. It's, you know, we could do a lot of things to kind of break the experience. So in part two, we're going to try to address some of those things while we also separate our code base. So here are our summary. Let's create a new mock-up for an improved version of the puzzle game. Each iterative goal will revolve around adding in these new features. So the specifications the thing that motivates why we need to continue working on this project, the reason why it's not done, even though we have an MVP build of it, is that we want to improve code maintainability. So we want to adopt better software engineering principles and refactor the code into three responsibilities, a model, a view, and a controller. We want to improve our controls. We want to make them more fault tolerant for the user inputs and prevent any kind of invalid values so that we can ensure that the inputs do not require even a, a keyboard, but also support mobile use, right? So if we do buttons, we could do it using either a key, like a, a mouse or touch controls. So we're gonna improve our controls. We're gonna improve the code maintainability, and we're also gonna improve the view. We're gonna have a better user interface user experience that's gonna have more styling. Maybe graphics isn't the right word yet, but styling is certainly gonna be something that is gonna be a consideration. So our responsibilities across our MVP is, well, again, our view is going to manage the output 
from the model to the user. The controller will, mount it, uh, will manage the input from the user to the model. And then the model itself, is, well, that's going to be the program's logic. So that's going to be the thing where that has all of our game rules in it. No, but with no input or output concerns. Okay, so that's our guide. That's, that's how you decide whether something goes in the model viewer controller. So let's take a look at this. Let's take this approach and start breaking our, it down across an MVC architecture based off of what we already have. So if we have a model.js, if we have a view.js, and if we have a controller.js, the variables that we currently have are passcode and tries. Well, that, those belong to our model. The functions we have is guess number and give clue. That belongs to the model. We also have print attempts remaining, print clue, and print game over. Well, that's an updating the view. So we would move those into the view.js category. And then for controller, we have, we'll create a function that'll initialize the controls and go ahead and set up for the button events. So all of the things that we're doing to start setting up our uh, event listeners, we will go do inside of a controller.js. So the first thing we do in our approach is break down the features we already have, all of our implementation, so that we can decide how, where it goes inside of this uh, uh, separate uh, JS files. So next thing we need to do is actually create a model JS, a uh, controllers JS and views JS. So let me do that. Let's see, model.js, and did, just out of curiosity, did I, uh, yeah, that is, Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, controls JS. And then I want to say I called it views JS. Perfect. Okay, so let's go over here. Let's go over here. And let me get these into model views and controls. Perfect. Okay, so now I have these made. So inside of my model, let me grab this. Oh Lord, it does a good job of uglifying my code. Okay, let's just do... There we go. Go. There we go. I'm not quite done yet. I'll stop that. Okay. This also has to be. There we go. Okay. So that is there. Let's do the same thing here. Yeah. And then that goes there and that goes there. So let's take a look at what's happening here inside of our model. So we are going to go ahead and create the passcode the same way we did before. That data goes in here. The tries goes in here as well. We have our function that's guess number where we decrement the tries and then we check if the guess is equal to the passcode, then we're going to invoke this function to print a game over. So notice this is a method call. And this method call will essentially be accessed and it'll send a message to our controllers script that will manage the logic for printing a game over message of when. So now that responsibility is outside of our model. And then we'll also check to see if tries is uh, less than zero or equal to zero. And if that's the case, then we'll go ahead and print a game over message to lose. And again, we're not handling the logic here. We're going to send that to a method call that will then exist inside of uh, probably views. It's the same here, but we're sending a message. Then we're going to print attempts remaining tries. And again, that'll probably go into our views, right? Based off of our uh, separation of responsibilities. And then we'll invoke the give clue message. Uh, and then I'll have this function that's called, uh, uh, I'll have this function called give clue, which I, I had before. But notice instead of, uh, instead of actually updating the HTML documents, I'm sending again these messages high, low, and the guess. To these print clue methods and again because we don't want to have that logic inside of our model that's going to be logic that has to be handled inside of our view to have the appropriate separation of responsibility so now let's go into our controller script and let's update that so that we can do the same thing 
And give me a moment while I uh, get this code to be a little nicer. Okay, there we go. So inside of here, I'm going to actually invoke a function. When so when controllers are initially imported in, it will initialize the controls method. So that's this function here. And so what initialize controls does is it's going to grab a reference of a button and then the guest button from the HTML document and it's going to set up the uh, event listener. So on a click event, it's going to invoke a button event with this callback function. So on the event that a button gets clicked, this will happen. So what happens here is uh, we're going to grab from our document the guest text text field. We're going to assign that to this number variable. And then we're going to invoke the guest number function from our model, right? Our controller is going to now send this number to the model where the model is going to process it. And then send out methods, uh, invoke methods to our view so that we could see how it got processed out. Excellent. So all of the, uh, all of the um, management of inputs is handles and controls. All of the management of the game logic is now in models. So now let's update our, uh, our views. Okay, let me copy that. And let me go into my views here. And okay, that looks great. And that looks great. And oh my, that's all over the place. This goes there. Okay, now let's see here. This goes there. This goes there. Yep, yep. Okay. And that goes there. Okay, so now let's take a look at what's happening. Now, only the map, the only thing that's going to exist in terms of my views.js file is going to be those functions that actually do mutations or updates or writes to the HTML elements. So I have a print attempts remaining that given some number of tries, will go ahead and grab that HTML element that manages the attempts text, and it will update it with the new number of tries, the inner HTML of it. I'll have a function print clues that given the status of the game and the, uh, and the, the current guess, it will grab the guess and then we're going to do this uh, tri uh, trinary, this uh, like uh, conditional operation. So we'll say if the status of the game, if the status of the guest was high, right? Because that's what gets determined here for print clue. If the guest is high, then it's going to print hi. Otherwise, it's going to it's it's going to give it lo. So we're using that as uh, to manage state inside of our game system. So if the state is, it was a high guess, then I will return back a message. I will over to clue, right? We're creating a variable that's gonna have one of two messages. So if the state of the uh, guess was high, then I'm gonna send this list item that says, oh, the guess is too high. And if, it, if it's not this, then that means the status is low. Then I would set to clue a list item where the guess is too low. And then whatever this is, it's either going to be one or the other. I will append this clue into the clue text inner HTML. And for the print game over status, I'm going to get again a status that's represented as text is either let's look at the model as either win or lose. So based off of these two states, I have to decide what the output's going to be. So if the status is win, then I'm going to create a message that's going to be this heading message and this, this paragraph, right? You win, you got it in this amount of attempts. Otherwise, I'm going to create this other message. You lose. The number was this passcode. And a message is going to have a value either from this if or else, right? I can see they're going to be this or that. So then what we're going to do is go into our document bodies, enter HTML, and then just overwrite the current value of the HTML with this new message. So this is the exact same code. But arguably, it's much more readable. It's, it's much easier to, um, to uh, have an expectation of uh, where inside of our code base these actions are happening at in order to be able to refactor it later and add complexity. Excellent. So then, now the next thing and the last thing we have to do here is we're going to have to go ahead and uh, add in these... Uh, these scripts into the index.html. So let me go to index. So I don't need game anymore, right? We've completely replaced game with 
this model view controller. So there we go. So we have view model controller, perfect. And let's go back. Okay, so now let's actually test it out. Let's play the game and see if it works exactly as it was working before. So I'll go here, I'll refresh. And look, it's, uh, what was this scripts? Controllers.js is not found. Let's make sure I named that the appropriate thing. Oh, controls, controllers. There we go. Trying to make sure things are named appropriately. This is why we test. Excellent. I just test this out. 500. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Okay. And let's test the win. Well, I can access passcode from here. What is it? 649. Yeah. Okay. Yay. We win. Okay. So our win works, our loss works, and our uh, clues works. Just make sure it works. Let's do zero, zero, zero. Numbers too low. Let's make sure this works. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we get a too low and too high. So the next thing we want to do then, now that we have refactored our code base, where all of the instructions are on one script, so that is now managed between a model view controller build, let's move on to refactor our user inputs. Because recall, another purpose of this build is to make our inputs more fault tolerant. So the new UI improves the precision and ensures valid input. Uh, so the scheme that we're going to use is based off of a combination lock. So think of a combination lock where you can rotate a, um, a digit from zero to nine, and you're uh, given a set number of digits you can rotate. So you're restricted to a zero, 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 all the way to a nine, 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 nine. So we're going to use that same kind of metaphor, which means that instead of, um, instead of having one number we're looking at, we'll essentially have to build our guess number from the uh, kind of concatenation of the individual numbers, the hundreds, the tens, and the singles digits. So in order to do this, we'll have to refactor the text input tags of our uh, HTML so that that is updated appropriately. So let me go over here into my uh, HTML. Perfect. So where I was just giving this one text here where you could put in a number, I'm instead, I'm going to define a div that's going to be three text, I mean, three input fields of the type number, where I'm going to assign a minimal value of zero, a maximal value of nine, and the initial value of zero. And then I'm going to give these IDs because I'm going to have to be able to grab each of these individual values inside of my uh, JavaScript. So I'm going to say that this is digit 100, this is the uh, tens digit, and this is the ones digit that this represents. Okay. So then the next thing I'm going to do is I then have to go refactor my code inside of my button event because my button event is the thing that's responsible for grabbing that. Okay. So let me go. Actually, I'll just grab this entire function since this is being weird. Okay. So let me go into my controllers. Uh, Okay, let's, it doesn't exist anymore because it's this. Shoot. Okay, let's go here. Perfect. And close this. Okay, so let's go into control. No, um, button vent. Yeah, it was this button vent we wanted to, yeah, modify. So, so I'm going to, so the new version of button event is I'm going to grab the hundredths. Uh, input fields. I'm going to grab the tens. I'm going to grab the ones, and then I'm going to concatenate that. So I'm going to build my number by taking effectively a string and concatenate it with whatever values from the hundreds plus whatever values from the tens plus whatever value is from the ones, and then I'm going to pass that newly assembled number into the guess number. Now, what's nice about this is because we separated this into the uh, model view controller scheme. All we have to do is modify our controller for this to work. We don't have to do, change any logic inside of our model or our view. So to get that refactoring, 
we just have to make those two changes, the, the change to the actual index.html and then the logic for how we piece that guest together. So if I refresh here, now I have this whole new input scheme. Notice now I can, okay, so I could do five, I could do seven, I can do uh, four, right? But now I can't ever go more than three digits. I can never do negative digits and I'm not allowed to put in any uh, letters. So now I have this fault tolerant uh, software scheme where it's ha it has to be a valid choice based off of the rules. So this has improved the uh, usability and the, uh, the fault tolerance of our software. Excellent. So now the next thing we wanna do for this goal is we wanted to find a class called guess. And so the approach for this is we want to model a guess as a class maintained by the model that the viewer, that the view controller can reference. And so here, let's take a look at this. And so the idea behind this is we want to be able to uh, update. Okay, we grab this. So let us go to our source code. Let's go into our uh, index.html. Here we go. So above, okay, so above the, um, the, uh, the input fields here, I'm gonna create these plus buttons. So I'm gonna create three buttons that I'm going to give the IDs up 100s, up 10s, and up 1s. Because I want to, instead of, uh, instead of having to put in those numbers with the keyboard, right? Remember, the other specification that we were going to do in this improvement was to add buttons that allow us to increment or decre decrement each of the individual values, just like you can do in a combination lock, so that we can play this on, using a mouse or using a uh, mobile phone. So I'm going to create a div to nest three buttons together. And one is to represent the hundreds field, one is the tens field, and one is the ones field. And then what we're going to do is we're going to disable our text, uh, the actual input fields that we're displaying in, so that you can't use those as inputs. We're going to, we're going to set it so that one, these are just for our view. And that, oh, no, no, not these. These are the buttons. We want these. The things that are that are showing off the number, we're going to change to just be view items effectively. And all of our controls into our model are going to come from the buttons. So I'm going to disable, I'm going to disable these text fields or these number fields so that we, we can only mutate them from our JavaScript code so that the user can't mutate the state of them. And then I'm going to I'm going to update and add this uh, gas JS. We haven't made it yet, but we're about to. So in order to get that into imported into our JavaScript runtime, I'm going to have to do that. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to create our gas.js. And that should be in here. Let us get that there. Excellent. And then for guest.js, what I'm going to do is let's read through what it's going to, how it's going to manage. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Yeah, the sun has gone into it in. Not an advantageous position for me. Okay. And oh, I guess I need. So, what is happening inside of gas? Let's take a look at it. So, inside of my gas class, I'm going to have a constructor, and my constructor will allow me to go ahead and construct an instance of, uh, of gas. It's going to start at with the hundreds place of zero, a tens place of zero, and a ones place of zero. So, we're actually going to create something that can track the individual values of hundreds, tens, and ones. A two-string method will do effectively what we were doing before, where we'll take an empty string and then we'll concatenate to it the hundreds place, the tens place, and the ones place. So I can build 
the unified number and then I will return that. And then I'm gonna create an increment method that will go ahead and I, I, I really like this implementation. I think this is a clever way of showing you how you can use uh, um, the box notation the like kind of array notation or dictionary notation inside of an object to do interesting things. So for increment, we're going to take a key and we're going to increment into our keys, whatever this is, we'll be able to go. So if this is uh, like uh, our hundreds or tens or ones, right? We'll be able to go ahead and uh, access that value and we'll read whatever that value is currently. We will add one to it but then we'll also modulus that by 10. So if it goes from nine to 10, that will mod it back to a zero. So this will be a simple function that we can define that lets me increment the value. And I see it's, uh, it, let's see, I, it's 318 for, so if for any reason you can't stay any longer for me to complete out this goal, then I will make this video available. So if you have to leave, um, obviously that's okay, but I'm going to continue this out just so that it's all in, in one video uh, to make it easier for those who are watching these afterwards. Anyway, so I have my gas here, my class gas. I have the ability to construct it. And again, I guess just manages the data that we're going to uh, be comparing to our passcode. And so we're going to define a, a method by which we can uh, change or mutate the state of our gas. Okay, so now that we have that defined, let's actually go ahead and use it. So let's go into our model and instantiate an instance of a gas. So we'll go into the model here and uh, here we will instantiate an instance of gas. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to refactor then inside of my Vue.js the print digits. I don't know if I actually have that though. Maybe it's, is it a refactor if it doesn't exist? I guess I'll add. Let's go into uh, views here, print digits. No, I have print attempting remaining, print clue and print game over. So I'm gonna add a new function that's gonna be called print digits. And what print digits is gonna do is it's going to access each of those values from the uh, input fields, from the number fields that we made and it will overwrite the value with the value from the gas, which is the hundreds, the value from the gas, which is the tens, and the value from the gas, gas which is the ones. Now notice for this particular application, I didn't leave these to be in, uh, private, right? So I, I allowed these to be public, which means I can easily just dereference them. Now, if you wanna use encapsulation, I would use get methods here if it were private, just but I didn't bother doing that with this lab. Okay, so now we can print the digits into our HTML page. So the next thing we wanna do is we, we wanna add a callback function to increment the gas and print to the view. So here we go. So we'll call this an increment event. So this is gonna go into my controllers. So inside of my controllers, I will set up this increment event, which will be given a key. And that key will be passed to my guess instance, right? That exists inside of my model to go ahead and increment it. So remember that mutates the state of one of its variables, hundreds, tens, or ones. And then it's gonna tell it to print the, those digits. And we, we just implemented the print digits uh, method that's inside of the view. So now I'm going to update inside my controllers this uh, init controllers function. So let's go here. Let's go to my uh, this function here that's responsible for initializing all the controllers. So here I'm going to grab a, a reference of the guest button, and I'm going to I'm going to register that with my event listener for the click event like we were doing before. But then afterwards I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab references of the up buttons, right? The up hundreds, the up tens, and the up ones. And I'm going to add click event listeners for those too. See, a multiple click events, but all registered on different HTML elements. On a click event here, if a click event occurred on this particular HTML element, 
then we're going to create an anonymous function that we're going to pass as our callback function. The reason why we're doing that is when we register a callback function, remember, we have to do a function object and not an invocation of a function. But on this instance, we want to register different behaviors. So the callback function we're going to do here is there's no parameter, but it's going to invoke the increment event, this one, with the, with the term hundreds. Now, remember, hundreds is the uh, instance variable name of this. So when this gets passed in as the key, I would dereference the hundreds value here, right? I can access and overwrite to this variable by accessing this instance using the this keyword. And then I can actually access its instance variables using the block notation, using the, uh, the square brackets, and then passing in a variable name here as a string, right? So this is a, a, a interesting way of me creating, instead of having an increment hundreds, increment tens, and increment ones method, I can compress that to be one method and accessing it instead of using dot notation, bracket notation. Anyway, so what I'm gonna do here is I will pass hundreds in here and that will get passed as the key. So that would increment the hundreds value. This would increment the tens value. This would increment the ones value. Excellent. So now let's go into, uh, lastly, my controllers. And my number instead is going to always come from our guess instance called the two string, our button event. So let me get to my button event. Guess. So here, Ed, it's just going to be guess dot. Uh oh. Two string. Excellent. And let's see here. Let's test that out. And now notice, I now have the ability to see these buttons. If I click, yeah, look, I can now increment this and then it goes back to zero. Perfect. And I can increment this one and I can increment this one. And if I submit, it's actually going to read that as 753. So now the implementation still works just like normal. However, um, however now, these are disabled. So all I can use these is viewing, right? And the inputs actually entirely rely on, um, on these button presses. Of course, this isn't quite done for the, that goal. The last thing we would wanna do for goal number two would be to do effectively the same thing, but also add uh, some decrement buttons. And so I'm just gonna quickly do that just to finish out here. So let me go to my uh, index.html. So just like I have these increment buttons underneath my disabled display of numbers, I'm going to add in another div that's going to have three different buttons that are going to have the value of minus sign. And I'll give those IDs of down 100s, down 10s, and down 1s to represent these are my decrement buttons for the 100s place, the 10s place, and the 1s place. And I guess let me save this out here and then inside of my guest class i will also add in a decrement method so here which will look not too dissimilar i will take in a key of either hundreds tens or ones i use that to dereference the instance variable and then what i'm going to do to assign it is i'm going to look if the value of that key is greater Greater than zero to nine, right? And this allows me to rotate it down. So I'll go from nine to eight, like three to two, two to one, one to zero, but then zero to nine. Excellent. So now that I have that, let's go ahead and wire that up into our system. So in order to do this, let me go ahead and create a decrement event. 
as a callback function inside of my uh, controllers. So just like I have an increment event, I'm going to create a decrement event. Perfect. And all that does is it's going to grab a key and that key will tell the instance, our guest instance to decrement based off of that key. And then it's going to print the new set of digits after that. Um, okay. And then what I want to do here is I want to go ahead into my controllers and into my init controls and actually initialize those new uh, event listeners for those buttons that we set up. So here, oh, let me tab this all over. So here I'm going to grab the references of those three buttons, the down 100s, the down 10s, the down ones. I'm going to actively, the reason why I'm doing this, I want to be invoking this event using a very specific key that gets passed in based off of what it is. So if it is the uh, hundreds button, then I want the key to be a hundred. If it's the tens button, I want it to be the tens. But since I can't do an invocation now, I want this, this invocation to happen when the click event occurs, then I'm going to pass this anonymous function, this anonymous fat arrow function, that when it gets invoked, it just does the decrement using the parameters I want. That's what's happening there, just like on the increment. Okay, and then let's test it out. Okay, let me refresh. And now I have a new set of buttons. I have the plus buttons. Now I have the minus button. So now I can not only go up, but I can easily decrement it down. And if I go from nine and this, this gives me the same kind of behavior you would have on like a combination lock. And now this is a much better implementation, right? So we started with an MVP build and then we refactored to have a similar gameplay experience, but we divided our code into a, a model view controller. And you saw how much easier it was to start mutating it and making it better. We identified that it wasn't fault tolerant, that we could put uh, faulty data in there. So we lock that out. You can't no longer mutate the actual number here. You can only control it from these buttons, which means that this is a universal type of input scheme that would work well for computers or mobile phones. And you will always have a valid state for our guess. So this is, uh, yeah, this is looking good. This is, we hit all of our specifications for this build. We hit all of the specifications we want from this build. I'm trying to get out the sound a little bit. Um, okay, so let me see here. And I think that that is the end of part two. So the last thing we would do for this, and actually, let me just see. I think we have a couple more. So what we'll do is we're gonna finish this lab off at the um on goal three on tuesday and so i'll cut off the uh, goal one and goal two though uh for today and make this available so thank you for uh for staying and watching and we'll complete this lab at the beginning of next week thank you have a good day okay i'm fine where my uh Where it is. Oh, I got a. Is it? I don't have any. Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking for. More. Stop recording.